the most direct, uh, thuggish possible challenge, I mean, a, a death threat backed by death squads from the theocratic leader of a foreign state. And when a lot of people didn't show too much stomach for that, that no, battle, no, that were. was a very educational time in my life. Are we missing out just how funny he was? Yeah, well, I want to make sure. I mean, the first time I met it was Martin who introduced me to Hitch. He said, you've got to meet my friend. So what did he say when Martin said... You, if, I, if only I can remember exactly what was happening. <laughs> first we went to Martin's rather disgusting little flat. Uh, I'm sure the word sock was born. Uh, and then we went... We seemed to specialise in those days in empty Greek restaurants. Uh, the only customers. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the two of you had a routine already worked out. Uh, <laughs> jokes were referred to merely by numbers or sounds or yelps that referred to long stories that had already been sort of um, encapsulated. The next morning I woke up, I felt as if my ribs had been kicked. Yes, um, because you'd laughed so much. No, and I mean, I, and I, he, was, he was very, very... No funny. question. I mean, I can remember sitting in Martin's kitchen in, in London actually weeping with, with laughter. I mean, actually, there's not very many people have actually caused tears of laughter yeah. to run down my face, but Christopher would do that. He, he once said about you, though, he said that the thing... <laughs> <laughs> lots of things he said about you. Uh, but one was that he said that, that, that about friendship, he said that uh, your love of language took precedence over your love of friendship. Um, I've been thinking about this. Um, when, when he came from America to England on visits, he used to ring from the airport and say, the hitch has landed. Is that what he, how, yeah. what he called himself, the hitch? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, well, self-conscious <laughs> irony. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would feel great excitement, but also the sense that I'm going to lose a chapter here. The chapter's worth of work. <laughs> and you'd have these amazing long lunches followed by a debauch in the evening that would leave you completely incapacitated for three, three days, days and three days, nights. Days, days. And, but he would go off, at, <laughs> just as you were sort of falling on your bedroom floor, he would go off and write a piece. Um, and I... And his generosity with time was amazing, that he would give time. Mm. Uh, he was a person for whom the clock hands moved slower. His day was longer than ours. Um, and his, uh, his energy on your behalf, which I, I've experienced too, mm. was extraordinary. And he'd get on a plane and, yeah. and come and deal with it. You know? yeah. And, and uh, I just... If you're a novelist you're, or a poet, then you're going to spend a lot of time brooding. Um, and I, I think that's why Hitch could not have been a novelist, no. although he had the, the gift of phrase and of mimicry and all the rest. But he wasn't a brooder, I don't think. No, he, none of that determined stupor. He, he no. Was, I mean, he was, he a did have... determined stupor. It's what well, V.S. Pritchett um, denounced Ford Maddox Ford for not having. Um, <laughs> the, the great novelists have the capacity for determined <laughs> stupor. I always thought... Was Christopher, a, was, he, in that sense, he was a journalist. He had that, he had that sort of yeah. file your copy approach you know, and, and yeah. he would he was as Martin says he'd go home after a long day of drinking and and lots of and, and, and yeah. you know and, and he'd write like 3,000 words and or file you, them or you'd fall asleep you know, in and, his apartment and they would not be yeah. incoherent they'd be extraordinary words I mean that was one of his uh, later utterances uh, in writing was that he did burn the candle at both ends and he said and sometimes that gives off a lovely light mm. but yeah. by Christ he did that um, in, in a sort of uh, preternatural way, I always saw it. And, and I think knew that, that it contributed to the illness that came upon him. If you had known that there was a possibility of getting cancer, you would never have spoke, you've never smoked a cigarette, you would have never drank the, or consumed the amount of liquor you consumed. No, I think all the time I've, I've felt that it's life is a wager. And that I probably uh, was getting more out of leading a bohemian existence as a writer than I would have if I didn't. So, and writing is what's important to me, and anything that helps me do that, or enhances and prolongs and deepens um, and sometimes intensifies argument and conversation is worth it to me, sure. So I was, I was knowingly taking a risk. I wouldn't recommend it to others. But he believed that the cigarettes and the booze gave him what he called a kind of junk energy. A ju oh, junk energy. Right. And that, and so in a sense, um, he was under the impression that he needed, that he needed that, those 
those two um, substances as, as a boost. Might not have written as much if he as, hadn't as, had that as, junk energy? As well, boosters. Part of the tragedy was that he was so robust. If he'd just been a little weaker physically, he could have taken all that drinking and smoking, all that rump and whatever yeah. the word is in Hindi that means... Or drinking and smoking oh, sorry, at the same time. Rump. Um, yeah. For all the drinking, he had one of the best memories of anyone yeah, I mean, he had, he had, around. He did have Incredible this ridiculous memory. head for drink, and I don't think it did him that much good. No, <laughs> he, he, the, the yeah. body didn't give yeah. him enough warning mm. signs. I think he said yeah. about you, James, that somehow after that you awakened in him uh, the far buried and dangerous lust for alcohol and nicotine. Oh, it's your fault. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I know he's often accused me of <laughs> of that. Simply because yeah. I bought him a drink in the King's Arms <laughs> in 1967. Yep. I mean, this really seems a bit in excess of the, <laughs> of the facts. Uh, I, I want to talk about two things. I want to come back to uh, uh, this nature of friendship. I mean, uh, you, you and I have spoken about this before at this table. The notion of, I mean, I think there was a quote in which he said something about uh, he called the relationship he had with you the most heterosexual relationship that one young man could conceivably have with another. And you said at the same time, it was an unconsummated gay marriage. <laughs> Martin, I didn't, you know, I didn't know it was unconsummated. <laughs> or that there was a marriage. <laughs> yeah, that's no, a civil no, partnership, Martin. Yeah, Martin. Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, 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 cards on the table. Yeah. Yeah. He tried to you consummate it every now and, and then. Yeah, yeah. He, he tried to consummate it every well, now and then. Well, he was sort of pan affectionate. Um, yeah. He. Big kisses. Big, um, yeah. Tongues. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I know it was in the, oh, in the too much uh, information. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, this is a family show, <laughs> and uh, idea show. You know, you say that he 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 sort of uh, lays it in on Wolfowitz, um, and he would perhaps do that for an hour or two. But he was the most egalitarian of uh, socialites. You're changing the subject, aren't um, you? Well, um, I, I have no case to answer. Um, and he, 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 was, he was very rude, as we said, and a talented hater and all the rest. But he, socially, his manners were impeccable and, um, and completely democratic, too. Um, yeah, but let me, let me, can I, may I just stay with this for a couple of months? Sure, yeah. one, one, one was that he cast himself as a smaller fish swimming alongside a great white shark. <laughs> he did say that about you. Now that had to do with, you know, the ladies. The ladies, of course. Oh, it did. right. Yes. 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 He said he was a small parties, fish casting alongside a great white shark. Speaking of you, <laughs> um, well, he he was um, incredibly unpredatory as a unpredatory. Yeah. Right. Um, girls would often throw themselves at him, and uh, for a good reason. He, well, yeah, yeah attractive, I mean, very attractive. You know, and, and um, as you know, w what he his. What he would do to charm people was to turn his intelligence on, on them and show his intelligence, and that was his, that was his, uh, his way of, of of attracting people. But he 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 was very diffident. Yeah, yeah but at the same time, was he Nicholas in your novel? Uh, yes, he so, was. Yeah. And so there was Nicholas, and you were Keith, and yeah, you know? so yeah, up to a point, yeah. Um, <laughs> in, in as much as you know, you. I, once they're in a novel, the the character changes to fit the novel, yeah. uh, so it's it never is uh, uh, the yeah. the person himself. But uh, there was one story that's that's in the novel, and I thought it was so great that I had to make a scene to give the punchline that Hitch gave, which was we were in a, one of these empty Greek restaurants, and two very upper class young men came in, and they were fussing around with the waiters and they had a terrible air about them as if they were you know stoically awaiting the deaths of elderly relatives so that they could come into their patrimony and um, they were fussing around so much so that it was impossible for for Hitch and me to, to start a conversation and then one of them came and crouched down in front of us and pouted up through his fr fringe and said they were obviously going to ask us to move tables but he, he said he said, you're going to hate, us, hate me for this. And Hitch said, I hate you already. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, and um, we moved tables quite genially, and they sent, sent over a terrified bottle of wine. And, mm -hmm. um, but uh, 
but but if you just sort of introduce him to your mother and your crazy aunts and so on, he would be absolutely impeccable and yeah. gentle socially. Um, let me let me raise this question about America. What did America mean to him? Because uh, he obviously came here and became an American citizen. I think I, I think he found his he found his full voice. I think here. Mm. I think you know, he, because I mean, as as we heard in one of the. Uh, clips you showed. I think he was actually very admiring of aspects of America, of its of its constitution, and, and, and he became a naturalized citizen at the Jefferson Memorial. Yeah, yeah. and mm. he became an even more of an American post 9/11. I mean, 9/11 was yeah. a, a, a turning point, a, a revamping of his love for the United States. If you went to see him in his apartment, he'd love to take you know, strangers up onto the roof and point out. The monuments as if he'd built them himself. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was very proprietorial. It was his Washington yeah. too. And as he was saying on that clip, he 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 was very moved by the American Revolution. He thought yeah. this was a revolution that had worked. Yeah. And I think he loved the fact that it's an immigrant society and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. the diversity that follows. Him. In this book, um, Hitch Twenty Two, he writes about uh, you know the first three chapters, and he, and he talks about actually in the. Edition, edition, this photograph in which uh, I think it was described, and I, I should give credit to the photographer. And Angela Gorgas. You know. Yes. You know. Um, he was described as the late Christopher Hitchens, which gave him, or provided for him, or was an impetus for him, or forced him, or linked him to consider mortality. And, and, and he sort of talks about this in the first three chapters here. Um, so let's talk finally about sort of the end and, and, and how he handled death. And, and each of you visited him and, and uh, saw him and talked to him. So did I in terms of an interview. When I went to do the interview, he was obviously not feeling well. Hmm. You know, and I said, Hitch, we don't have to do this now. We can, I'll come back another time. You know, he said, no, I want to do it now. He had a bucket next to him. You know, and, and he's talked about that too. I mean, it, it, and the evolution of the conversation, it seems to me, and correct me because you were a thousand times closer than I was, was from, in terms of the illness, was sort of metaphysical, and then it became in his writings describing the physicality of it. Hmm. You know, and then perhaps somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, How did well, he just, approach dying? Well, just to say at the very beginning of it, I mean, when Hitch 22 came out, uh, its publication event, was here at the 92nd Street Y, and I had agreed to go and and lob questions at him, right. you know, and, and um, so I did. And he was at his best, you know. He was at his kind of knocking him out of the park. His kitchen's think. best, exactly. I mean, I and and I mean, I wasn't just throwing softballs, you know. There were a few curveballs in there, but he was brilliant, brilliant for and for at least an hour, and then a bit more with the Q and A, and then afterwards there was a dinner for him and with a few friends and, and publishing people and so on and, and he continued you know to just hold forth and be at his absolute peak and then afterwards i discovered as we all did that that that, that was the day that he morning had, he that had morning he had been he had. told about the cancer and i just thought how do you do that i mean i wouldn't be able to do that i don't think you know to go out there in front of a thousand people and just perform brilliantly when you've just been given you know possibly Terminal news. A death sentence. Mm, a death sentence. One way he dealt with death was to write so well about it. I mean, you remember those early pieces for uh, Vanity Fair, Vanity Fair or, I think for, in his column, yeah. uh, described really in terms of crossing a border, uh, the border guards being the medics who greet you as you come across, and suddenly you're in different clothes, and the land of the healthy that you leave behind. Uh, it was beautifully done at the very beginning. Um, visiting him was, well, I mean, we all went. Uh, it was not like visiting most others. Because